George Germain is the civilian figure most blamed for the British loss. He was Secretary of State for America, the man most responsible for the war in Britain. But Germain was a veteran administrator who'd served in the army. Uh, at one point, he commanded as many as 3,000 cavalry. And Germain was responsible for getting 35,000 men out to America in the summer of 1776, which required every merchant ship uh, in the British Marine. Uh, he had a staff of 25. Uh, he was moving troops from Germany, from southern Ireland, where a third of the British army was based as a kind of police force, and from England itself. Germain believed that the best opportunity to win this war was a knockout blow against Washington's army in 1776. The majority of military historians have always endorsed that view ever since. And Germain always felt betrayed by his commander in Canada, Guy Carlton, and William Howe in New York because of their interest in really trying to negotiate peace rather than in, in uh, a more ruthless conduct of the war. He argued that, in fact, it would be crueler to drag out the war, that there would be more deaths, and much you could only negotiate once you held the upper hand and had won a major victory. It might be said that there's only one biography of Lord George Germain. It's worth keeping in mind when you think of the historiography of the Civil War and how many books we have on its individual leaders. Uh, it gives us you know, at least some insight into the comparative neglect. And the same is true of Sir Henry Clinton. There is only one biography of Sir Henry Clinton. It happens to be an exceptionally good one. Some would say one of the best written about commander on either side. It's one of the few times that the Bancroft Prize has been awarded to a military historian. But it was written at the height of psycho-history. And uh, it was much influenced by um, the Freudian model. And the argument of the book is essentially that he was a neurotic, uh, that he'd had a distant father and an over-domineering mother, all of which was interesting because we know almost nothing about his childhood. It is, though, true that he was a person who suffered considerable anxiety, and it's a bit like the old joke, the good news is that you are suffering from anxiety, the bad news is that you have much to be anxious about. <laughs> because Sir Henry Clinton was being expected to win this war with fewer troops, less naval support than the Howe brothers, at a time when Britain was simultaneously a war with first France in 1778, then Spain in 79, and then Holland in December of 1780, with much of Europe signing on to the League of Armed Neutrality, which was essentially a hostile league uh, to Britain. And Clinton was being expected to win. He was, in fact, the most cerebral of all the British commanders, and in many ways best understood the nature of this war. He knew America, like a lot of these military commanders. He'd actually grown up in New York. His governor had been, his uh, father had been governor of New York. The family held land in America. And he saw clearly that, in fact, Britain should probably have de been defeated much earlier. He saw at least three occasions when the French Navy and the Continental Army could have imposed the kind of crushing defeat that uh, was indeed uh, achieved at Yorktown. He understood and he warned his superiors from the moment he took the senior command, which indeed he tried to refuse and he tried to resign at a time when the Prime Minister was trying to resign and the Deputy Commander-in-Chief were trying to resign as Lord Cornwallis, all in 17. 78. Uh, father had been governor of New York. The family held land in America. 
and he saw clearly that in fact Britain should probably have de been defeated much earlier. He saw at least three occasions when the French Navy and the Continental Army could have imposed the kind of crushing defeat that uh, was indeed uh, achieved at Yorktown. He understood and he warned his superiors from the moment he took the senior command, which indeed he tried to refuse and he tried to resign at a time when the Prime Minister was trying to resign and the Deputy Commander-in-Chief were trying to resign as Lord Cornwallis, all in 1778. But he understood that the moment there was a superior French Navy at sea, uh, there was a, a very easy opportunity for any detachment of the British Army operating outside of New York to be cut off, which is exactly what happened at Yorktown. But he understood something even more important, and that I'll come back to in my discussion of why Britain lost. He understood that this was essentially a war of hearts and minds. Indeed, he, he used the phrase, we need to win the hearts and subdue the minds of America. Uh, he understood that having civilian support was critical. He suspected much earlier than any other commander that the, the stories that were fed from home and fed to the British government about massive support for the British cause were inflated. He argued for very gradualistic approach of training loyalist militia, working with loyalists, but never making smash and run uh, raids. Uh, he argued you must have what he called solid campaigns. He argued the loyalists could not work without the support of the British Army. They had to work together. He was, incidentally, the best read uh, member of the British military in the 18th century. There are over 30 uh, of his letter book, um, his notes, in the John Rylands Library in Manchester on military history strategy. We have no equivalent of that for any other member of the British Army.